My name is Neeraj Shah. Now, um, you know, we obviously we're going to be talking about mutual funds. Uh, just a small introduction to today's show. If you have decided to invest into the markets via mutual funds, uh, you want to know what is the ideal time frame for investing in funds. I know the common answer is invest for the long term, but how long should this long term be? And what if uh, you had or you wanted to know what's the minimum time frame for which you could be invested in a particular set of funds um, which give you the guaranteed or at least a reasonably sure shot uh, return potential or an estimate of what the returns could be like. Uh, now, there are various methods to probably do this. One method that uh, our guest today is going to be presenting to us so that you as an investor in mutual funds can make use of the same is the concept of rolling returns. Sound Greek and Latin? Well, maybe it is. Let's try and simplify that. Mr. Sunil Subramaniam of Sundaram Mutual Fund joins us right now on the show to talk about that. Mr. Subramaniam, so good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Now, I think a lot of our uh, viewers would be interested in knowing that what is a rolling return and why shouldn't I just stick to what I anyways get on a number of websites about the return that a mutual, particular mutual fund has done over one year, three years, five years. Can you explain? Yeah. So basically, uh I think most investors are aware that equity markets are a risk reward mechanism, right? They take risk to deliver reward, right? Now, what brings risk to the equity market is the basic cyclicality of economies and the markets which follow. So what happens is that typically, as you mentioned, investors, when they look at past one year return, past three years, five years, they are ipso facto using that to say the next one year, the next three years will be a repeat of the last. And so they say they pick the best fund of the last three years and think that it will be the next, right? Now, why is it that a fund which has done very well over the last three years is not the best? It's not that the fund manager suddenly becomes inefficient versus efficient. It is because the kind of stock picking he had done in the past, the same thing cannot continue in the future, right? So the how do you then use it? If I'm saying that this is basically a flawed mechanism because cyclicality means that the past is not a predictor of the future, then there's, is there a mechanism which can help the investor in this journey of picking the right mutual fund, the right asset allocation within large caps, mid caps? And I would say yes. And that is where I come to what I call as the bulletproof method of uh, estimating future uh, probabilities of returns, which is called the rolling returns methodology. So rolling returns methodology, if I can take a minute to Please. explain, uh, what it says is that, let us say that uh, you want to test it out over a 15-year period, let us assume, and you want to test three-year returns over a 15-year period, which means, let's say, 15 years from now would have been, let's say, April 2003, just to take an example. So what it does is, it says, on April 1st, 2003, you made a three-year investment. Hmm. It would have matured on 31st March 2006. Hmm. Right? And what this says is, assume that you made a three-year investment the very next day, on 2nd April. Second April. It will mature one day later. You made one on the third day. Right? So if you do that over this period of time, you will get probably four, five thousand three-year periods yes. in that 15-year period. Yes. Now, what is the thing that that 5,000 periods give you first a large enough sample size where the average can be reliable, mm -hmm. one. Two, in this a probability of a 15-year time frame that you would have seen a bull market and a bear market. So you will know that what if I had made an investment in a bear market, exited in the three years in a bull market, I would have made super solid returns. Whereas if I had made it in a bull market and exited in a bear phase, I would have made negative returns. True. Right? So since a common man doesn't have an understanding of is a market at the end of a bull cycle, beginning of a bull cycle, the rolling returns essentially is like a blind man saying, I put my three-year money in the last 15 years, what is the average probability you would have got, you can also suss out the minimum return. That is the worst loss you would have experienced. Also, if you got your timing right, the best return you would have ever got. Hmm. Right? So, if you have this set of data points, and then it will show you that two, three things. So first, so if you take this for the Sensex, which is broadly perceived to be the market, 30 stocks, it would be stunning for you to know that if you were blind about it, you needed a period of seven years in an investment the saying, says, no, be assured of not losing money. This is uh, the average or this is the worst possible seven-year return? That this is the worst. So in seven years, the worst possible return is 1.5%, which means you never lost your capital. Okay. Right? Why I'm saying this is every investor, there are different investors with different risk appetites. Right? While people are attracted by the rewards of equity, many are not willing to take the risk of equity. It doesn't mean the equity market is a no-no. Hmm. All it means is stretch your time frame hmm. to such a period that you don't have a risk of loss. 
So this is the first help of the Roaring Hills methodology that okay. based on the investor's risk appetite, right? Whereas in one year, 20% of the time, the Sensex lost you your money. So if somebody who's willing to take the high risk, in one year, you probably got 110% return in the best of times. Got it. So uh, attuning yourself to your risk methodology, you can even chime your investment using Rolling Return methodology. Okay. The second thing... Uh, sorry, just before we go there, because we have these graphics that uh, mm -hmm. we've gotten made as well, I think this is the point that uh, Mr. Subramani is trying to make. Just look at those three indices on your screen, S&P Sensex, uh, S&P BSC 500 and the S&P BSC Mid-Cap Index. And I think the point that uh, Mr. Subramani... This is the point-to-point -point return, but let's move on to the rolling return. Uh, that's the next graph that we have, uh, rolling return analysis, and that there is a one more graph the third one, which showed that over a seven-year period, the returns move on from being negative to being positive. And I think that's the point that is, uh, the, this is a CAGR return? No, there's uh, the graph that was playing before I think this, that. Uh, you can see it there, the percentage mm. of positive return periods. That right. means never lost. So at seven years, it's 100%. Hmm. So the second uh, row in that tells you the total observations. So there were 5,297 one-year observations hmm. and 3,100 seven-year observations right. over the last 15 years. And as you can see, you had a 19% probability of losing money. That is 100 minus 81. But when you came to seven, you had zero probability of losing money. Losing which money. means even a risky equity market, if you gave it seven years, didn't lose you your money. So as a FD investor, if you want to look at equity, this will give you that capital protection which you are looking at and some return at the end of it. Right. So that's the that's where it helps you to do that. The mid cap index would have a different time period, right? And funds would have different time periods. True. So this, if you are able to do this, it helps you to a time the tenor of your investment. Second, you can also time your uh, you can choose your how much in large caps, how to mid cap based on the. Probability how, how would you do that, sir? So when you look at the average returns, hmm. right, or you look and you, when you blend it too, right? So for example, uh, if you wanted to say 50-50 large cap, mid cap versus 80-20 large cap, mid cap. Mm -hmm. Both those you just combine and see which fits your risk return profile. So any amount of permutation combination which suits you. So if you say, look, I want to maximize the return, I'm willing to take the risk you can play around with those numbers and get that number out. The point of this exercise is that if you do this with point to point, if I go back to the point to point slide. Sure, right, we can go back to the point to point slide. What well. happens is that if you see last one year, the mid cap index has given a negative return. So an investor looking at it today, oh, I don't want to reinvest in mid cap. But if you look at it, over seven years, it gives 13.4. So the last seven years, however, is not the next seven years. True. But if you take the same thing for the mid cap index and look at what is the probability of loss in one year, this was probably one of those probability periods of loss. That's all. So I, the point is just using the immediate past to predict the future is very flawed and it leads to a lot of disenchantment with first time investors if they come in and then, oh, I, this market I thought last one year was 15%, this one year I've got negative 5%. True. Right? So if you do this, it sensitizes you that there's a 20% probability of loss in the Sensex on a one year investment. Got it. So once you move in with that, then your preparedness for the result also improves yourself. So the overall investor investment experience itself will be much better if you're aware of what is like that. Right. Now, my, my question, Mr. Subramanam, is that as we said, that there are probably from over a 15 year period, there are about 4,000 uh, three year no, returns yeah. that an investor yeah. would have gotten. Some would have shown negative returns, some would have shown returns which are exceptionally positive. Mm -hmm. How do I make use of this data? Let's assume I'm able to calculate it and that would be my next question, but we'll come to that in a bit. Let's assume I have these 4,000 uh, data points with me. Mm. How do I make use of uh, these data points wherein one data point is showing me the worst possible return and one data point is showing me the best possible return? Do I average them out or do I take time periods and then figure out that okay the best return could be this but the worst return should be this so I should be prepared for this? How do I make use of it? So that's not, no need to do that. Once you do this exercise the mm. average return also throws up. Right. Which is the true average. Okay. Because it's the average over 5,000 periods. Right. So I think the average which comes from that right is a far more reliable average saying on an average average I would have got this so there's no need for you to add plus and two minus the same thing we automatically calculate an average Excel has a simple formula at average for these returns and in a drop of a second so it's so the point that we're trying to make out the point that if I'm understanding this correctly that if I have an average let's say for the Sensex mm -hmm. or a large cap fund let's say I'm choosing to invest in a fund and the rolling return analysis of that fund suggests that the 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 break even point for that fund wherein I will not make a loss mm. almost certain is about seven years yes then 
if I'm investing in the fund, mm -hmm. I could well go in with a mindset that let me invest for at least seven years because then my capital is for sure protected. Is that the way you would approach this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can do this for funds also. You mm -hmm. need the information from the fund house. And you will find that on an equity, equity market uh, mutual funds have actually protected capital over five years itself. Interesting. Which itself tells you that they do better than the index in that, right? So this could also be a way of evaluating funds to see at what point do they protect capital. So, for the, and that's why I said, the point is that it's important though to understand your own risk taking capacity, right? So in a way, the maximum, minimum and average can be equated to a pessimistic, in, a optimistic individual, pessimistic individual, and somebody who's more realistic saying, yeah, on average, I'll get this, but that could be either way. So the key element here, two points I want to drive with that. Please. Past performance to predict future is what is used by everybody. Hmm. Do I come and tell them don't use it? There's nothing else to use, so what else do they use? So if you want to use past performance, which is the only realistic, use the rolling returns past performance, right? Which will give you a reasonable estimate of the future and will help you to prepare yourself for the worst case scenarios, the best case scenarios, right? The why it's important the best case scenarios, most like I said, you do a goal-based investment. And the key is that when your goal is reached, you get out. Right? We may not be, you may choose a seven year investment, but your goal was to triple your money or whatever. If you reach it in five years, this tells you that take it out. Sure. Right? So I think the, the beauty of this analysis is that it manages expectations, it's a more reliable predictor of the future, hmm. and it's basically a probabilistic tool. How do I, as a retail investor, get this data? Okay, so as a, there are two choices, of course. One is, I think most advisors have access to, uh, you know, value research, money control, uh, you know, uh, NAV India, where this daily, you need daily data start, points et cetera, et cetera. of the market, mm -hmm. you need daily data points of the fund, right? So most of your advisors should have this. It requires a little bit of hard work. It requires an Excel spreadsheet to do this, right? So those who are mathematically think, all it needs is that you go and pick up daily points of the Sensex, right? If you were doing it for the Sensex, put it in an Excel sheet. It's almost like a daily SIP, right? So suppose you're doing a one-year thing. It's like every day you make a one-year investment. So it's like a daily SIP. You just put it into Excel, and Excel has enough features, right? So of course, a little bit of knowledge of Excel would be required otherwise that. So it should not be a problem. But otherwise, I would say, an advisor would give you the capacity to do this for multiple funds and show you the fund manager who has protected your capital in the least amount of time, who has, when the going is good, maximized your return the most, right? So all kinds of, uh, you can play around with the numbers from an advisor's perspective. So I would say that, to me, the investor, to the advisor, should challenge the advisor to say, please show me the rolling returns, whatever you're recommending, show me the rolling returns performance of it, and then why are you choosing X fund over Y fund? Is the rolling returns performance of this one better than that one? And then when you go with the choice, you have the data, please take a printout of that and keep it with you. So at the end of three years, you see whether that helped you or not. Because I think preparedness for the outcome, right, is half the battle. True. I yeah, that's, 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 well, that's well put. Um, the final question that I would have on this subject is, uh, to have, have these parameters worked very well across fund sizes and across time frames? I mean, have you had a chance to analyze some of your funds uh, irrespective of the size with the rolling return criteria and have they given an almost near accurate returns if you indeed uh, use the rolling return criteria in the past as well and not just right now? In fact, I'll go one step further. So I will tell you that even a high risk funds, right, like a mid cap and a small cap fund, over five years have always protected capital. Okay. One. And what it has done, this study has helped us, is that we make most of our investments with a five-year outlook on the stock. Mm -hmm. So it's actually fed into fund management and fund management is fed into the result. Because when you buy a stock with a five-year outlook, intermediate points of volatility in the stocks, EPS, price, everything, actually make you keep a level head and look at that long-term goal because of your assessment. And what this shows is that the fund manager's assessment of the five-year performance has by and large turned out correct. Otherwise, you could have never protected the capital. So I think this has a very close link. This is something we use all the time in terms of assessing. And one additional point on this, right? Now, I'm saying this. There are lots of people who are on this, listening to this show who have already invested in the market. Now, let's say over the last one year, I showed you mid-caps so have shown a negative return. Now, you invested in a mid-cap fund, or let's say, or in the one year back. Now, you're sitting on a negative return. So you'll be worried. What do I do? This rolling return slide, like for example, if you take, I told you, a five years is a fund has particular capital. What this gives you comfort, independent of that past one year's negative return, you waited for four more years, you're assured of not losing your capital. 
So even for existing investors, it's not that only to make a fresh investment, you need to do a rolling return. I would encourage investors already to their portfolio, to that fund to do a rolling return. Then if you're facing a situation, and the other way too, right? If your returns are very high, and you look at the average returns, and you say it's going to revert to that mean, you can also decide how long do I stay invested. So I think it's a very powerful tool. I've just given a glimpse of the, the thing, but I think, if this were used more often by investors and by advisors, it would make the whole disappointment with equity performance, people saying, I want your SIP return negative. It would make them, A, say, this is the time frame I wait. And second, they know that in one year, this was the probability of a negative return, sure. and they're prepared for that outcome. So I think the overall uh, milieu of stock market investing from an investor, uh, advisor, and the manufacturer perspective would be much healthier if this could be an industry-wide practice and adopted by a larger proportion of its constituents. Well, let's wait and watch. Uh, um, I just hope that via this conversation, what we've probably tried to bring to you is one more arrow in your arsenal to try and analyze your investments in a better fashion. But as Mr. Subramaniam said, uh, um, you know, do ask or do consult with your financial advisor and see if you can get it. If you are indeed an Excel genius or a mathematical genius then and want to invest in funds, then maybe you can try and attempt some of this yourself as well. Might help you better in choosing the funds and then staying about it. In fact, even might help you in trying and identifying how soon do you get out of these investments too. Mr. Subramanian, I'm so good having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us and explaining a rather difficult concept in a much simpler fashion. Right. Really appreciate Thank your time. You. Thank you. Thank you and so much. Wish all the viewers all the best. Thank you so much. It's Thank a you. happy festivities. Same, same to you <laughs> and to the viewers. Yes, okay. So that's the view from Mr. Sunil Subramaniam of Sundaram Mutual Fund, who just spoke to us about the rolling return concept. Uh, well, one way to try and um, identify how best to analyze your mutual fund investments. As we said, maybe get out or stay in into these investments as well. What we'll try and do now is, uh, as we promised, uh, try and get in an advisor who can advise about some individual schemes as well, some ways and methods of trying to uh, you know, analyze the current investments that you have. A bunch of queries have come in to us uh, on various platforms. Uh, to answer all of them uh, is, uh, Joining us right now on the show is Harshwardhan Rungta of Rungta Securities. Uh, so good having you, Harsh. It's been a long time. So My good having you back on the show. My pleasure, Neeraj. Uh, just, you know, we were on the concept of rolling returns. It's not easily available for uh, investors, whether DIY investors or for um, even advisors. Do you think it's a concept that at some point of time in the near future could take definitive shape and form? In fact, Neeraj, when you look at uh, the merits, the benefits of rolling returns, there is definite uh, you know, uh, merit in that. I mean, there's no question about it. The, the hard part is, the difficult part is that we don't have that data accessible. So if you can get a trailing return data point from a fund house, and uh, you know, it's available on aggregator websites, it's available on several online medium. If you could have a rolling return uh, you know, data available, readily available, then you could do a lot of work around it. So one of the options is, yes, of course, you can know that what is the probability of losing money or making money in equities over an X period of time. There's another thing that you could do is you can also evaluate the consistency of a fund performance. What has been the uh, consistency in giving an X return in different time frames? So it's a very, very good uh, qualitative data. The only issue is where do you get it from? Where do you get it from? And if you are supposed to sit down and make this, fair enough. It is not a very difficult exercise that you can do it if you wish to. Just that you know there are so many data points and so many uh, you know different comparisons that you would want to do. That becomes difficult to sit down and do it yourself so all maybe, the time. Maybe an ecosystem at some point of time could de get developed wherein advisors uh, could get the data from fund houses on specific schemes on the rolling returns for various funds and maybe clients can get it from their advisors. Uh, so maybe that's one way to do it. Frankly, if you can calculate uh, the rolling return concept yourself, then you're looking at mutual funds in a very deep fashion. You may not need an advisor, but for all of you who do not understand concepts like this and you know want to invest in funds, maybe going through an advisor is a better route. However, as promised, we have one eminent advisor on the show today to try and talk about some queries. And uh, for all the queries that have come to us before the show, let me try and take some. We'll also request Harsh uh, to try and res respond to some of the queries that are coming in live during the show as well over the course of the next seven days. But let's start off with the queries, uh, Harsha. And Sagar Shetty is the first query. Uh, on Twitter, he's written to us, and he wants to plan a long-term investment for his daughter's higher education, who is one right now. He wants <laughs> to know, looking at the current market volatility, which can happen at any point of time in the future, what's the right way to go about it, a pure equity fund or a balanced advantage fund? So well, the good part is that uh, the child is one year old and you're actually planning for a higher education which is 20 years from now. 
So clearly, it's a you know it's a straight off uh, a winning situation because a smaller, smaller. Even if you invest small amounts of money over a period of time, it's going to compound and become a really large amount. So with a less amount of investment, you can really gain a lot. The concern is, oh, of course, I mean, given the current market volatility. So if you're investing for 20 years or a 15 or a 20 year time horizon, you really need not worry about what's happening in the in the last six months from now, right? So equity, whether pure equity funds or a balanced advantage fund, you know, let's not get into all that. You know, let's understand what are these products by itself. So if you're investing in a pure equity fund, and if you have a lump sum amount of money, so if you have a large amount of money which you're putting it right away into the fund, well, in the short term, you could see even if you put a one lakh of rupees, it could possibly become even 50,000 over a period of time. And then it could recover again over, you know, after a couple of years. So if you do not really want to go through that process, then you pick a balanced advantage fund. And if you are investing every month, and you're going to continuously invest over a period of 15 years or 20 years, then you really do not want to be in a balanced advantage fund. Okay, why so? The, the reason is because balanced advantage fund uses an underlying matrix to determine how much money will be invested in equities and how much will, you know, at what level will they invest how much in equities. Now, if you're investing monthly, if you're investing a small amount of money every month, you rather take the advantage of investing in equities rather than playing and trying to time the market, you know, in that sense. True. Now, when you're investing as a lump sum in a balanced advantage fund, you know, there is a fear that you do not want to really lose capital because there's a large amount of money you're putting in. So that is the time that you will want to possibly take a balanced advantage fund kind of an approach. Now, the, both kind of schemes have the merits and demerits. So let's look at the demerits of a balanced advantage fund. The demerits is in a rising market, the balanced advantage fund will not give you as good returns as a pure equity fund will. Why? Because that's exactly the matrix. When the markets go up, they reduce the equity exposure. And if the markets are going up in a sustained bull run, you will find the balanced advantage funds always underperforming. And in an equity, if you're investing a lump sum and the markets fall, that is the time you will have a lot of loss onto your capital. So how to take the best of both worlds? One is if you're investing on a staggered manner, that is SIP, choose a 100% uh, equity fund. And if you're choosing, a, if you want to invest as a lump sum, and you want to be a little cautious with it, you don't want to really enter markets at an expensive valuation, then in that case, you can choose a balanced advantage fund. When you choose an SIP in equities, you're anyways buying at different levels. Yeah. So that purpose is already being solved. Yeah, I think that's the point. And it's a very interesting distinction that uh, Harsh has made in the session today. Harsh, thanks for that. Uh, that's, that's good learning. Okay, the next question is coming in from Sandeep uh, Kurela. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. But Sandeep Kurela is wanting to know if it's a good thing to invest in GSEX via brokers or is it, a, is it good to go via debt funds and what are the tax implications? Now, Harsh, if you've kind of understood this well enough, you can give some advice to Sandeep. So, well, what Sandeep is essentially asking is, today, when you want to buy GSEX, so, you know, essentially, the, you know, it's all done through the NDS, and uh, the participants who buy and sell uh, GSEX are institutions or primary dealers or banks, insurance companies, mutual funds, they're the ones participating over there. Essentially, the size, the transaction size is reasonably large, so about, say, 5 crores each, each transaction. Retail investors cannot really get into that kind of a system. It's a wholesale market, right? Sure. You can't just go and get into and say, I want to buy five lakhs worth of hmm. GSEX. Hmm. But in case you want to hold GSEX, so what is the way that you will invest in it? Currently, the system is that you can, you, you know, investors go to mutual funds, you invest in a G, uh, guild fund or a GSEC fund, and you invest even 50,000 rupees and it gets invested. True. So in, a, in, a, in effectively buying government securities. Now, uh, about two, two and a half years ago, government opened up this uh, system wherein even retail investors could go directly and buy GSEX and hold them in their own name, in their own DMAT account. Now, for this also, you need to go through a bank or a primary dealer. Now, and this will come into your DMAT account. So, though it's an SGL, uh, you know, that's the GSEX are held as SGL, but they get converted into uh, and transferred into a DMAT account. The question is, why would you want to go and buy GSEX directly? So the advantage is that you know you have all 10-year papers. So you have something which is even a three-year, you have even a 20-year paper in government securities. They're sovereign, so there is no loss probability over there. So if a retired person has just got a large amount of money in his hand and he wants a secured source of interest, so he buys GSEX for, say, 20 years. The good part is that he's assured for 20 years return. So he knows that it's government securities, no credit risk, there is no default risk. And for 20 years, he's going to get an X interest rate. So that is one good side of it. Okay. The other is that if you're going to buy and if you want to sell it at one point in time, then how do you calculate the YTM? Because interest rate movements have to be tracked. You have to know when to exit, when to, you know, and then liquidity again is a problem. I mean, where are you going to go and sell 50,000 sure. or 5 lakhs worth of? So keeping all these in mind, though the window has been opened up, 
but do you really see yourself gaining out of investing in directly in GSEX? So okay. for an investment, one of the one of the parameters is what is the convenience factor? Convenience factor. You do so suppose you feel that there's a there's a very good plot of land in some remote area where you've never visited. Yeah, what's the point of buying it? What's that? the point of buying it? Because sure. you're not going to be able to maintain it, you're not going to be able to know how to buy and sell it over there. So you yeah. don't do it, right? So GSEX also falls to the same category. You have a fund house who has got an expert fund manager who's Bank doing it for that. you. So why not pay a small fee and actually get it done through that mode? So I would suggest to Sandeep is that he should go through the mutual fund route. That would be far more simpler. Okay. Well, um, and for almost all answers, all queries really, I think um, there's some reasonably good answers coming in as well. Well, um, my producer tells me we've done about 24 minutes already. So we have uh, about four odd minutes left. So let's try a little bit of a rapid fire. I'll take in some queries very quickly. Girish, we won't be able to dwell too much on your query, but let me still try and take it. Uh, Girish Kumar has been doing SIPs in mutual funds via the regular and the expense ratio for over a long period of time, 10, 15 years. He believes he's losing significantly on returns. He's now switched from regular to direct before the market fall. Okay, and is continuing SIPs in the direct fashion. Now, is this correct? I, I have an answer to that too, by the way, Arsh. If you want to take, you can take, or otherwise I can give the answer. <laughs> well, I would just like to tell him one thing is that, you know, so he, you know, the question, if you, if you see that, you know, pertinent, the emphasis is on, he bought into a direct plan before the markets fell. Hmm. So now the markets have gone down, so there is some kind of a fear that, you know, I don't know what to do about it. So it was not that because you shift to a, shifted to a direct plan that the markets fell. It's just that what do you do now is a point in concern. So had you been in a regular plan with a good advisor, maybe somebody would have hand, uh, you know, uh, held your hand and guided you into saying that, you know, really, we don't need to worry if you're doing SIPs, continue doing that. That is what the answer is, what we are giving you over here. Hmm. But in any case, uh, direct plans are for people who can, who can and want to manage their own investments. Yeah. If you cannot do that and you're switching, because there's also one question concern that there's a higher expense ratio in a regular plan. So if you're sh switching from a regular to direct, only to save costs, then it's not a wise thing to do. Yeah, um, maybe, you know, uh, I'm the one to give advice, but maybe I can tell you that if you're indeed so confident about uh, what you're investing in mutual funds for and where you're investing in funds, then maybe these calls are okay, but do not take a call of moving out of an advisor-led model to a direct model just to save uh, that small cost. Uh, do it only and only if you're sure that where you're putting your money, you understand the product very well. If not, that little bit of expense paid to the advisor is probably a better thing to do. But this is the limited thing that I've learned over the last one and a half years by doing this mutual fund show. Uh, so that's um, the response to you, Girish. Uh, one small repeat question of sorts, um, uh, and that's from Nihar Bora. Um, one lakh surplus wants to park it again for daughter's higher education for a period of 16 years, wants to start 5,000 rupees SIP as well, needs fund suggestions. Would you be able to give some? Yeah, so we'll just go back to our own original uh, recommendation, which is that if you're investing a lump sum, market valuations, everything is a cause of concern. You really don't want to enter into a market which is highly valued, you know, and all those kind of things. So the lump sum investments that Nihar wants to do can go into balanced advantage funds. I, we could split this into two parts. I could recommend the scheme names as well. ICSA Prudential Balanced Advantage Fund, he could put a 50,000 rupees. Aditya Billa Balanced Advantage Fund, the other 50,000. For the SIPs, as you mentioned, because you're already investing in a monthly mode, you're investing at every level that the market is going to touch in the next 16 years, maybe. Uh, so an equity, a pure equity fund is better. Two schemes for that as well. An IDFC Nifty Fund, a two and a half thousand into that. And SBI Magnum Multicap, the other 2,500. So SIPs okay. in pure equity, lump sums in a balanced advantage fund. Great. And Neha, that's your answer. And I'm sure a lot of other people can make use of that answer too. A lot of other queries, but yeah, unfortunately out of time on this show. But as I said, we'll probably request Harshwardhan to probably give out, go out over the week and maybe try and respond to some of those queries on the social media platform as well. Harsh, thanks so much for taking the time My out pleasure. and being with us. My it's a pleasure. pleasure having you on the show. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to this leg of the Mutual Fund Show. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint.